line of best fit, also called a regression line, can be used for prediction purposes. You can use a line to predict something within your data. That's called interpolation. And if you use your data to predict something outside of your range, that's called extrapolation. Probably seen those words earlier in math classes, maybe even as early as grade nine, they talked about interpolation and extrapolation. So far, if we wanted to find our equation of our line of best fit, well, we drew it by first finding our mean point. And then when we drew it, you can look, do you go through any other point on your line? If you have another point, as soon as you have two points on a line, you can calculate the slope. And you can either use y equals mx plus b or your point slope form y minus y1 equals mx minus x1 to find that equation. So below are students' term marks and final marks for this course. One person got 95 in the term, 95 in total. The other person 66 in the term, but their final mark was 59 because their exam mark was a little bit lower, and so on and so on. And then there was one student who had an 80 going in, and due to dislocating their shoulder right before the exam, they didn't have to write it, so they were marked absent with an excuse for that exam. So when we're finding the mean point for this data, we're going to ignore that value because it's not a complete value. So we can add up all the x values, which are term marks, and divide by 9 add up all the y values, which are final marks, and divide by 9. Mm -hmm. You know which one's x, whichever one is listed first in your table will always be x. So either the first row or the first column. And so we have a mean point for this data that's 75, 72. Part B and C, we can draw a scatter plot and then also create a line of best fit for this. So what I've done here, I drew my scatter plot. By I, I figured out this is the line that I want to do where half the values are above and half the values are below. And in drawing that line, I happen to also go through another point right here. So I'll let you add those points in. So for my slope, I guess here I'm using this other point here, right here, 80, 85, 88, 85. I use that to calculate my slope, rise over run. And then once you have your slope, you can choose either y equals mx plus b which you can plug in your slope and plug in your point and solve for b. In this case, I got b to be negative 3, which gives me an equation of y equals x minus 3. Or you could use y minus y1 equals mx minus x1. This formula is the same thing 
except you plug in your slope and you plug in your point and then you rearrange it. And when you rearrange it, you automatically get B. Okay, just a show of hands with this formula. How many people remember that formula from grade 10? Yes? No? Yeah, but you didn't use it? It's actually a really, e okay, question. How many people remember the slope formula? Good. Can you see that those two formulas are basically the same? If you just multiply by the denominator on both sides, you have the same formula. But instead of having two points to plug in, x2 and y2 just becomes x and y. It's the exact same formula. It's just your slope formula rearranged. And that can be another easy way to remember that formula. And now if we want to predict if you happen to get injured right before the final exam and not be able to write it, and you went in with an 80, what would be fair for the school to give you as a final mark? Well, according to this data, most students' marks went down after their final exam. Some went down more than others. But on average, it looks like most students' marks went down by three marks. So to be fair to the rest of the students that had to write the exam, it could be argued that this student's final mark, having not written the exam, would be 77. Now, if the school used this, then there could be dangers involved. Other students are like, that kid never studies for an exam. Let's quick, let's go injure him so he doesn't bring down the rest of our marks. <laughs> that would be a bad, <laughs> a bad result of using statistics. <laughs> it's like, I better start studying, otherwise the other kids are going to beat me up. So the slope in our line of best fit is a really important value because it has a lot of meaning associated with it. Now what your slope is, your gradient, when it's a decimal, it says that's how much your y value increases when your x value increases by 1. Because if you had a slope of 3.7, you could write it as a fraction 3.7 over 1. And remember, slope is rise over run. So your rise is how much your y value changes. Your run is how much your x value changes. So when you write your slope as a decimal, you can always write it as a fraction over 1, which means your y value in this case increases by 3.7 when your x value increases by 1. Now, sometimes it's nicer to have your slope as a fraction with whole numbers. So if you had 37 over 10, that's the same as 3.7. But that means that your rise is 37, your run is 10. So your y value goes up 37 every time your x value goes over by 10. And that's what's saying in the second line, if your slope or gradient is a over b, like 37 over 10, every increase of 37 in the y variable would be an increase of 10 in your x variable. The y-intercept just is telling you what's happening when x is 0. The y-intercept may sometimes have no meaning whatsoever. Okay? So for example, um, when a baby is born, they measure their weight and they measure their height. So you might be, do, do you remember how tall you were when you were born? Do some of you know that you were like, I was 19 centimeters, I was 21 centimeters? 
Your parents might remember exactly what you were. Do you remember your weight when you were born? You're like, oh, I was a heavy baby. I was nine, nine pounds and six ounces. Or I was super light. Okay? But there would probably be a relationship between the height of the baby and the weight. And you could draw a scatter plot and have height as your x value and weight as your y value. And it would make a nice line of best fit. Because chances are, if you're taller, you're going to weigh more than a, than a really short baby. Because it's not like, oh, that baby ate lots of cheeseburgers before. Th that doesn't happen as much. So there's some variant in there. But in this case, the reason I bring this up, it doesn't really make sense to look at a y-intercept. Oh, this baby was born with a height of zero. OK? How much do they weigh? Well, it might be it might be that you get a y-intercept in this case, because a line of best fit might actually go through the y-intercept and be like three pounds. So all babies born with a height of zero weigh three pounds. Well, that wouldn't make sense in this situation. So it might not always be meaningful. Yeah, this will be a good one. Age and years. A person, a young can, person and time, they can run one kilometer. Nothing like making a one-year-old run a kilometer and timing them. It's a great study. Might border on abuse for that one-year-old. Okay, but they only collected data between kids ages 7 and 18. And they came up with this regression line. 20 minus 1 half x. Do you think they just did that to mess with you a little bit? Because you're so used to y equals mx plus b, but now it's like 20 minus 1 half x. Could you rearrange that to be 1 half x plus 20? Yes. Negative 1 half x plus 20. No problem. But you'll find that equations don't always match how you think about them. Sometimes you have to do some rearranging so you understand them a little bit more. So what does that negative 1 half mean? Interpret the gradient. And it's not going to be enough to say the gradient is negative 1 half. How and what does it mean in this situation? Use the variables that are given, the situation that's given, and be able to explain it. Well, we have a rise and a run, y values and x values. What's being compared here? We could say that for every year a child's age increases, that's your x value, their time to run one kilometer goes down by 0 0.5 minutes or 30 seconds. In this case, the y-intercept would be 20. Okay. This doesn't quite make sense, right? That baby that just popped out, you put him down, say run a kilometer, <laughs> and it would only take him 20 minutes. That doesn't seem reasonable at w at all, either. Other things that might not be good for reasonable reasonableness of this study. I would love if this continued. Right? Means once you turn 40, you can teleport one kilometer. Nice. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen. Spent a whole hour yesterday trying to teleport. No luck. Maybe I just didn't try hard enough. The important thing, though, is when you go to describe these situations, 
you have to use the situation that's in there in your explanation of what is the meaning of the slope and what is the meaning of the y-intercept. So here's one for you to try. Again, check how you did. Thinking about this one, could this one exist with no trees? Could there still be birds in the area with no trees? Maybe. Okay, so that might start to make sense. Right? If we extrapolated too far ahead, it's like, oh, let's put a billion trees in this hectare of land. Well, then all of a sudden that doesn't make sense anymore either. Yes? Ooh, that's a good question. That might be good. If there's no trees, is it still a forest? Well, you could find... You could find any, like if you looked into, this is good theory of knowledge, here we go, bring it in, right? If you went to a part of a forest that didn't have a tree, are you still in the forest? Or are you only walking in the forest if you're walking on a tree? Hmm. Or in a tree. Then again, teleport from inside one tree to inside another tree. What is the definition of a forest? Does a forest, could you have a forest of bushes? Does it have to be trees to be a forest? Or could you have bushes to be a forest? And if bushes are allowed, then what about like stalks? Things that aren't quite bushes but are still kind of big. Is it a field of corn? Ooh, isn't there a movie? It's called Field of Dreams. Or is that a baseball field? But a baseball field doesn't have any trees. Oh my goodness. Everything just got ruined. Okay, there's, there's your theory of knowledge excerpt for the day. Hope you enjoyed it. Now, Mathematicians, I hope you were like, while you were doing the mean point and drawing the line of best fit by eye, I hope you were feeling a little bit of uncomfortable, uncomfortability? No. Uncomfortable. Discomfort. Discomfort. Great word. <laughs> Great word. I like that, though. I sometimes will make up words. Yeah, a little bit of discomfort because you're like, well, my line of best fit doesn't match with your line of best fit, and then <coughs> whose is better, and then, yeah. So doing it by eye might not be the best, so we have to come up with what would be a system to make the best line of best fit, and how would we do that? <coughs> the system that came up with was the least squares regression. So that line of best fit with was also called a regression line, and that's based on this concept that we want to make our line of best fit as best as possible. How would we define best as possible? Well, if you draw your line of best fit, some of your points are above the line, and some of your points are below the line. And what you want to try to do is you want to try to minimize the distance that those points are away from that line. So for example, I could draw this same line of best fit has three points above and three points below, right? That still has three points above and three points below. Why is the black one better than the green one? Well, this one you could say, well, by eye, it looks closer to most of them. 
but how do we measure that closeness? What we do is we look at each point in particular and see how far it is away from the line. And we want to get that number to be as small as possible. But the problem is some points are above the line, so they have a positive difference. And some points are below the line, having a negative difference. And if I just added up positives and negatives, some of them would cancel out. So what we do is we square all of those differences. Remember doing the squares before when we were doing variance? Sort of similar to that. We square all of those differences and add all of those differences up. And we want that to be as small as possible. So you look at, OK, if I tilted this a little bit, these ones would become bigger. This one would become smaller. Which is the line that is the best? It also still goes through your mean point. What's the word in the box? I have to go. Oh, there you go. Ha, the residual. So that distance between your point and the actual line of best fit is called the residual. And then we square all of those values and add them up. And we want that to be as low as possible. This will give you a better and more accurate value for your slope. Although the formulas don't look very pretty. OK, so your slope will become SXY over XX all squared. And you're like, well, what does SXY stand for? Well, that's where you multiply all your X and Y values and add them together. Add all your X values, add all your Y values, multiply them together, divide by how many you have. Whew. Are we going to let our calculator do most of this? Yes. But again, it's important to understand what our formulas mean. So we're going to look at our formula a little bit with these. Like, for example, mathematically, what's different between what's in the green box and what's in the purple box? Okay, If these are my x values, 2, 3, and 5. Okay, a little bit of mental math. What is the answer to the green box? What is the answer to the purple box? <coughs> Anybody get an answer for the purple? Thirty-eight, and the other one is a hundred. Yes. So how do you do the purple? The purple says square each x value. Two squared is four. Three squared is nine. Five squared is twenty-five, and add them up. Four plus nine plus twenty-five is thirty-eight. The green one says add all your x values up and then square your total. So 2 plus 3 plus 5, that's 10. 10 squared is 100. So the main thing I'm looking at with these formulas is can we read the formulas and at least understand what they mean? Now I'm curious, are these formulas on your formula sheet? We'll have to take a look. So if we looked at the numbers that we have, and if we just had three points, 1, 3, 
2 comma 1 and 3 comma 5. We can make a big chart having x, y, x, y, and x squared, and sum them all up separately. And from that, plug those into our formulas that we were given. So using the formula, you get a slope of 1. You still calculate your mean point, which is 2 comma 3. And then your line of best fit will go through that mean point and have that slope that you calculated. And if we go up to look at it, That's the best line that fits through there, that reduces P, Q, and R to be as small as possible. I think in particular, you know, if you just had these three points, right, it'd be really easy to be like, oh, that one's pretty close. Actually, I want to make it go a little bit lower. It'd be really easy by eye not to come up with a good line of best fit. Now we're going to look at taking out our calculator. So with your calculator, go to stat, edit, We'll put in the three points that we had, which are 1, 3, 2, 1, and 3, 5. 1, 3, 2, 1, 3, 5. Now to create your scatter plot, go to second stat plot, click on your first one, turn it on, and the type that it has is the scatter plot here. Your X list is coming from list one, your Y list coming from list two. And then when you go to graph, you can go zoom, and number nine is statistics. That will set your window up so that it shows your points the nicest. But after that, you might want to go to your window and check. So on my window, it started at 0 0.8 to 3.2, and Y went from 0 0.32 to 5.68. I might want to change those to go from negative 1 I don't know, let's just make this go up to 4 and negative 1 here up to 6. So now when I hit graph, I can at least see my x and y axes. So there's my three points, and I want to draw a line of best fit through them. So to calculate our line of best fit with our calculator, we hit our stat button again, and we go over to calculate, and there's a bunch of regression lines that are possible. If you thought it looked like a parabola, you might want to use number five, a quadratic regression. We think it looks like a line, so we're going to use number four, linear regression. So once we click on number four, it says, where's your list? We've got X list list 1, list 2. If you go down, we don't have any frequency. If you go down to store regression, you can put your regression right into y equals right away. So in this case, that is going to be really helpful. If you go to your alpha menus across the top, you know how you go alpha, f1. If you go to y variables, y1 is listed right there and push enter, 
it will type y1 into that. Then when we go to calculate, it finds our line of best fit. Notice it's the same slope and the same y-intercept that we calculated by hand. But now if I go to y equals, you'll notice it typed it in for us right away. And so now when I hit graph, I have those three points and my line of best fit in there as well. The statistics unit, one of the hardest things in the statistics unit is getting to the point where you feel comfortable using your calculator to get these values quickly. Because if you can use your calculator, you can get values quickly. But if you don't remember how to use your calculator, it can be very problematic. So we just need practice doing more things with our calculator to find these values. Uh, in your instructions, okay, uh, you can add here, what was it, alpha, was it alpha F4 that gave us? Yeah. In order to store that regression, another way that you could get your y1, and this is what the instructions are saying, another place, I'm going to go back to stat, calculate, do this again, number four, linear regression. Another place that you can get the y1 is under vars, which is variables, and then over to y variables, enter on function, and then the y1 is stored there as well. So that's another way that you can get the y1 from your calculator. So now we've got our equation pasted, which is really nice. So now in example two, and I'm going to get you to try to do this one on your own. Use your calculator to put the values in. Sketch the scatter plot on your calculator. Find the regression line for the line of best fit. And you can you're you are apparently flying out of Shangji Airport. And those are the different costs that it costs. And then we can get estimates for a thousand and two thousand. Our equation we'd write down with our approximation sign 0.117x plus 83.3. Because we've rounded to three sig figs, so the approximation sign needs to be there for that. But when we use our equation, we're going to be using all of our values to figure that out. So what you would have in here, and I'll 0.117x, I have the rounded value plus 83.3. You would have the exact value. And you've set up your window to zoom stat. I'm going to just set my window up. We have to go up to 2,000, so I'm going to go up to 3,000. I'm going to go by 500. And the costs, what were some of the costs? It looks like the highest cost was around $300, so I'm going to go up to 500. So there's my line of best fit. It's not exact because I used the rounded values, but if you stored yours, your value would have the exact values. So then, use your equation to estimate the cost of a thousand kilometer flight. Well, x is your kilometers, y is your cost. What you're doing right now
is plugging in a thousand. And you could type that equation into your calculator and get a value, but on your calculator, and this is what I wanted to show you, your calculator with a graph can calculate a lot of things. So if I go second calculate, one of the things it can calculate is a value, number one, and you can just type in your x value, boom, it finds your y value. Now, my number here isn't exact because I'm using approximations. When you put 1,000 into yours, what do you get? 200.64. Nice. So here, the answer is approximately $201 to three sig figs. Notice with my rounded one, I would have got 200. Then I would have had to write 2.00 times 10 to the 2 to write sig figs. But the sig figs were different using the rounded answer versus the real answer. Now, often on these questions on the exam, they have, if you wrote your equation to three sig figs and then used it, they would still give you full marks. Although the 201 is a better answer. Because generally, we don't like to round early because it can cause some mistakes. Use your equation to estimate the cost of a 2,000 kilometer flight. Same thing, plug in $2,000. But again, what I'd suggest is go into your calculator. Once you've calculated one value, you don't have to go second, calculate again. If you just type in 2,000 after that, it'll go to another value. 317.3 is what mine comes up as. When you do it on yours, what do you get? 318. So that would be your better answer. And we're going to add a part D to this. Okay. You have four hundred dollars in your pocket. You just say, just chuck me out the window when we get that distance. I brought my own parachute. Of course, you forgot that your parachute had like little metal hooks on it and it didn't get through security. But whatever, it's another story. So how far could you go? How do you use your graphing calculator to help you figure this out? So we go to our calculator. We now, there's not a place, so you go to second calculate. The value allows you to plug in an x value. There's not a place where you can plug in a y value. However, you could go to y equals, and in equation number two, you could type in $400. y equals 400 would be a horizontal line. Now when I graph that, I get a red line that goes across that represents $400. And now you could use your calculator. Second, calculate number five. Where do those two lines intersect? Enter on the first curve, enter on the second curve, enter again, and you would get 2,706. Hmm? Is it, what, did you, what does yours come up with exactly? 2,698. Ooh, that's a good answer. I like it. Okay. So the actual answer is 2,698 dot dot dot, decimal dot dot dot. How would you round that to three sig figs? The only way that you could write it is 2.70 times 10 to the 4. Algebraically, how would you solve this one? Well, now we'd plug in 400 for y.
And it's not super hard to do the algebra to move the 83.3 over and divide by 0 0.117. The algebra is not hard, but we want to be aware that plugging in y equals 400 and finding the intersection is probably faster. So if we have a faster technique with our calculator, we want to be able to use it. So your job that's really going to help you with all of the calculator questions you have this year is to think, how would I do it by hand? Solve it by hand if you can. How would I do it with my graphing calculator? And then after you've done both, which is faster so that if I have a question like this again, I can use the faster method? Because sometimes we as students get you know, pre-calculus in particular causes us to think about doing it algebraically, just plugging in 400 for y and solving this, when our calculator can solve it for us quicker. If that's the case, we want to be able to use our calculator to do it quicker.